Hi, welcome to the Pursuit of Truth. So some more videos from Sky News, different range of ones, still continuing on from the uh, Hospital Al Shifa, what's happening there, um, tunnels, um, protests, um, there's the Israeli protests to uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, parliament to, to try and get the hostages as their priority released. There's the Palestinian, uh, pro-Palestinian protests going on um, and there's a bit about climate change as well. But um, the main thing is for these, there's more examples more you know, of different people, whether it's the suited leaders, you know, the journalists, the actual real people mm -hmm. with heart and intention, and to see the difference between how we all operate and what crazy world we all live in, where we are sitting here watching live on TV like some Orwellian nightmare. People dying, children dying, newborn babies dying, um, people justifying things, you, you, you know, humans making, you know, I'm not just trying to blame one set of people. This isn't just about Israel and Palestine and mass. This is about the West. This is about all wars, all governments. Those people who started manufacturing bullets, weapons, bombs, um, ships, jet fighters, nuclear bombs, all of these people that made these things so that we could have a more efficient, better way of killing each other is not about, you know, you'll hear me talk about these different things, is not about, I'm not, you know, it's not really about the tags that we put on ourselves, it's actually about humanity. We're all human beings, all human beings are, you know, it's a war, like the last one, the humans at war. We're, we're at war with each other. It's just we've got different names for each other and different cultures and all those different things, man-made constructs that we learnt over time that enabled us to not see each other as each other. And so that it's easy for us to, to pull that trigger, to drop that bomb, to justify that, oh, well, this is war, war's messy and we're trying to do our best. We're not trying to hit targets, we're not seeking them out. Yeah, and that's probably true. I don't think they're going up and saying, well, there's a civilian, let's go and kill them. But that doesn't mean that they're, that they're actually also thinking on the converse of that, that, one minute, there's a civilian there, let's stop because we can't do that because if we kill that one, then it's, you know, even though we kill the one we want, it's still killing a civilian because it's not like that, like in that refugee camp where 100 people were killed for one uh, Hamas soldier. And I'm not trying to defend Hamas or anything like that. I don't care. They mass their massacre. They not no. They don't care about the massacre. Don't care about them. The massacre they did on October the seventh has made them fair game in the system that we live in because that's a terrorist action and that's a heinous crime to go in and kill people, no matter what's being done to you. It doesn't make it right for you if something's been done to you. It doesn't then make it right or justifiable that then you can go and do it to someone the same thing or worse to someone else. That doesn't work. It's never worked. That's why I don't believe in war and retribution and things like that. Because it doesn't work. If, you're, if someone does something bad to you, do something good, you may change that person, you may change other people around them. But if, you do, if someone does something bad to you, you do something bad to them, then you're just creating and an, uh, endorsing that hatred, endorsing that violence. I'm not talking about the, the parties involved, I'm just talking about that as a notion. So yeah, here's the clips. Uh, unfortunately, the first one, it has... Um, is it Peter Warner? I can't remember his name. He's the IDF spokesperson for the military. Um, I, unfortunately, it didn't record the beginning of it, but it starts with in, in, in the middle and they refer to it later on. And there's a few other clips um, to highlight this Hamas-Palestine war, um, Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, to just to show that how we can lose ourselves. Because deep down, I know, you know, and you hear this from Israelis and Muslims and Palestinians and, you know, Christians and uh, non-religious human beings, let's put it that way. Human beings, all human beings, I hear them, the pain. It doesn't matter what side you're on. You're, we're all human beings. We hear that pain. We hear that we all want to live together. We want to live in peace. We don't want fighting. We don't want killing. No one wants any of these things. It's disruptive and it, it leaves such devastation and takes away the one existence we all have. We only have one existence. Imagine this was your one existence. 
and it doesn't I'm not asking you to to hate one side or be with one side or whatever I'm not saying that because that's missing my point we're all human beings you know we all should be trying to find a way to be human beings with each other to be humane with each other to live with each other to find that way of doing that and not just falling into the easy way of like oh well i'm going to support you and hate this one and this that and the other falling into the man-made constructs because that's what you're doing you know that's that's how the media and military and world leaders suited people like to put it like to polarize you into thinking it's this are you this side or are you this side which side are you today on this issue you're on this side on this issue you're on this side and this thing you're on this side which football team this side and which you know player you like this one and this one and you know always trying to get you to go against each other whereas what you all are what we all are as human beings there is no polarization there is no you know we're human beings but we, because of we've had thousands of years of this being put into these little bits of land and cutting it up and saying this is yours and you must defend that and hate this person or you know this that and the other because we've gone through all that for years we've forgotten of that we've forgotten we're all human beings because we just see that oh we're this we're that we're this tag that we've been given thousands of years ago by people that just want to be greedy and possessive and didn't think about humanity and what's the benefit of humanity and that's why these are examples of the failure of the system that we all keep in here's the first one to be changing from not just the north but also uh, down in the south would you say that you've achieved your objectives in the north because you haven't got the hostages back you haven't defeated hamas and the number of people killed according to the gazan health ministry is more than twelve thousand. so the, the operation is advancing according to our plan we have not got a time limit on this war precisely because we realize that counter-terrorism is not a quick fix. Nobody can quick fix a, a terrorist organization that embeds itself within hospitals, that embeds itself within, within UN facilities, that embeds itself in schools, that embeds itself in high-rise buildings. It's a long, um, a long battle. And what we are doing, we are defeating them on the battlefield. We are destroying over, over hundreds of tunnel access points uh, we are engaging the enemy wherever they are. We're taking out their leadership. We're going to make the area safer for everybody, Israelis and Pal Palestinians alike. So I would how say... Ma how would many say how many civilian casualties is, is too many? That any, hmm, that's a very, very, I would say, problematic question. There, no, there is no price to a civilian life. But unfortunately, it is a reality that we have faced and we we need to do everything we can in order to distinguish between the civilians and the terrorist organization and we do need to con constantly review our military the military necessity of our strike to ensure the advantage while mitigating the civilian strife and operate in a level of proportionality that is expected from all professional militaries and i would say that is precisely what we're doing but i do say every civilian life is Tragic, the images coming out today from Gaza and have been coming out are heartbreaking. And it is an unfortunate reality of this war. And I say again, it's not a war that we wanted. It was a war forced upon us uh, by the brutal massacre, murder, rape of 1,200 Israelis and 240 or so still being held hostage by Hamas. And, and what of the 52 children who have been killed in the West Bank? I can't comment on the, on specifics in the West Bank. That's a very generalization. And obviously, when you give it a, an oversimplified number like that, I can't address it. The situation in the West Bank is also challenging because we've seen an increase, an uptick in attempts to launch attacks from the West Bank as well by terrorist organizations like Hamas, but not only Hamas. And they're also operating in a, in a way which is is challenging. And we're operating in order to counter those activities and make sure that they cannot succeed in, in killing more Israelis. All right, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, thank you for talking to us on Sky News. Good day. Let's take a look at the weather. On our top story, the war between Israel and Hamas and the growing humanitarian crisis that's facing Palestinians. The pain for Palestinians is not restricted to the Gaza Strip. At least 52 children have been killed in the West Bank since the Hamas attacks. It's been the deadliest time for them since 1967. 
Amongst them, Taha Mahamid, who was killed two weeks ago. He was only 15. Taha lived in the West Bank town of Tulkam. Our correspondent Mark Stone travelled there to speak to his family, a warning that his report includes the moments before and after Taha was shot and killed. It is two years since I was last here deep in the West Bank, and today it is a different place. Beyond the Israeli checkpoints, guarding ever-expanding Jewish settlements, illegal in international law, is a Palestinian population more squeezed than ever before. Shops shuttered, streets deserted, and communities cut off. We're going to go up to this one here as we cross. We're trying to reach the town of Tilkaram, and it's hard going. Every road we try is blocked. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. What is? What's? Do the Israelis put this here? The Israelis closed it, he says. We have businesses everywhere here. We can't work. When did they close it? Then a quick retreat. Oh, the army's here now. Uh, the, I the IDF's just turned out now. Let's see what they say. The Israeli crackdown here in the West Bank intensified after the Hamas attacks from Gaza. Shalom. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. We're from Sky News. What? Well, why is this uh, closed off? Because they see all the fire. Yeah. They set here a fire. And we don't want they do, we do a mess. Yeah, but you've shut their you've shut off their their village they now. They have other roads. They have other roads. Okay. On the barricade, the graffiti says Hamas. Well, we've been trying to get to the town for about an hour now, and every road we come to uh, looks like this, either barricaded by the uh, Israeli military uh, or it has a full Israeli checkpoint uh, on it. You know, Palestinians so often talk about feeling suffocated, uh, and right now it does feel like that more than ever. It took a while, but we reached Tulkaram eventually. We'd come to meet the Mohammed family. Ibrahim and Nahida lost their son two weeks ago. The family watched from their balcony as 15-year-old Taha was shot dead below them. He'd heard Israeli troops were in town and he'd gone out with a friend, phone in hand, his family said, to have a look. We're not showing the moment he died, but he appeared to present no threat. The screams are from Sarah, Taha's sister. She'd just filmed her brother being killed. He is in the paradise right now. He had three shots. His leg and the last one in under eyes, his eyes. Yeah. Moments after, she filmed her father. He'd gone out to help his son. He too was shot. Ibrahim is out of hospital now, his physical wounds healing. I saw my son laying on the floor with no value, like an animal. I said, I am a father. The boy has been killed. I ask for mercy. Then I heard bullets around me, and they hit my back. And my daughter said, come back, Dad. Taha is one of at least 52 children to be killed in the West Bank since the Hamas attacks in southern Israel on October the 7th. That is more than in any other month in 56 years. If this was your son, and what they did to Taha, they did to your son, would you accept to live with them? They're killing children. All the children were killed were like Taha. They went to buy things in the shops and rockets fell on them. And children aged 10, 11, 14, and Taha was 15. Most of them are under 20. We've asked the Israeli military twice to explain what happened that night in Tulkaram. They have not responded. The Palestinian ambulance was allowed access at 4.44, according to the time on the video. Taha had been left for an hour and 14 minutes. 
All this in the name of Israeli security. You have to wonder what impact that has on the people here, on the next generation of Palestinians. And do you think that it's possible for Palestinians and Israelis to, to live alongside each other? No. No. It's our land. Just for us. All of it? Yeah. Just for us. The West Bank or all? All. It's our land. Not possible to share anymore? No. No. Mark Stone, Sky News in the West Bank. Well, let's take a look at where this conflict may be heading on a military front with our analyst, Sean Bell. Um, hello there to you, Sean. Um, I was speaking to the IDF spokesperson a short while ago about the seeming shift in uh, approach to be going from the north uh, down to the south. Um, it doesn't appear that they achieved what they wanted to in the north, does it? No, and it was interesting listening to his answers to your questions because, A, he had to admit that they haven't achieved what they set out to do, but it was ongoing, the whole operation. But it's very difficult to see where they're going, to, how they're going to achieve those objectives. And part of the nervousness is always, we're hearing from the IDF, we're not hearing from the other side, and increasingly become a bit sceptical about um, the narrative and the films that we're being shown. But the IDF so far have been focused on phase one of their operation, which is in, obviously, northern Gaza. It's very unclear what their military objectives were because it was, seems to be the initial phase was driven more by anger and a political imperative just to do something after that 7th of October date. Um, but the three objectives that seem to be were seize Gaza City. They've done most of that above ground, it appears, but obviously the tunnels, the Gaza uh, metro, almost certainly not. Second objective was to destroy Hamas. They evidently haven't achieved that yet. And the third objective was around the hostages. Mm. They haven't released those. So, uh, and of course, the context of this is: meanwhile, there's been um, over 11,400 deaths, according to the Hamas-controlled Palestinian Health Authority, um, and the humanitarian situation is spiralling. Some footage here of some of the IDF moving through uh, northern Gaza, and of course, also at the start of this conflict on the 7th of October really robust um, international support, particularly from the US and the UK for Israel. But of course, as the casualties are mounting, as these military objectives aren't being achieved, the language is changing fast and we can expect to see that increase in the coming days and weeks as Israel continues its military operation. So let's talk about then what we're seeing in the south, um, residents there, some of whom are only temporarily there because they fled from the north, um, being told that they must go even further to a much smaller area closer to the Rafa border. Yeah, the IDF um, uh, claims they're going to expand their ground operation and they're going to chase down Hamas wherever they are. Clearly, they've been focused in the north and eventually, uh, inevitably, a lot of Hamas have moved south, so IDF are going to have to chase them into the south. Now, the IDF's already acknowledged that's going to be incredibly difficult because there's an increased population density down here because, yes. obviously, where do they go? And as you say, at the moment, that although they haven't completed their operation in the north, they're preparing the ground in the south. We're here, they've um, launched leaflets around Khan on Eunice. Uh, all of that is designed to try to get the population to move west to Al Mawazi there on the coast. But just imagine now, this is one of the most densely populated areas in the world, and now you've taken a load of people from the north to south, and now you're clearing this area and putting it right the way on the coast. It's very difficult to see how that's actually going to work. Why Khan Yunis? It's because this is the power base. Obviously, Yahya Sinwar, who's the Hamas leader in the region, that's why they're focused on this. But the key factor here, with increased density, they won't be able to do airstrikes the way they have been doing, the Israelis, mm -hmm. because obviously massive increase the number of civilian casualties. So it would have to be ground forces. That will inevitably involve more casualties from the Israeli Defence Forces as well as civilians on the ground. One of the options might have been that they would, having cleared from the north, actually move all the civilians back to the north because they could have controlled the access across the river, stopped Hamas leaving and then tackled the Hamas situation. But of course, that would take the people away from them. Humanitarian aid support, which of course is, is absolutely vital. So now the IDF say that they're not going to stop this war until they've got all the hostages released. But I have to say, the more you look at this, the more the military operation is going to have a significantly great number of casualties, and that's going to increasingly test the patience of the international community. Yeah, certainly one to watch, isn't it? Uh, Sean, thank you very much indeed. Well, there was certainly one to watch as the proper response to to this humanitarian crisis. It's like, you know, as if she's talking about some... I don't know, anyway. Um, 
But the bit before where the girl said it's our land, this is the problem. This is the crux of all this matter and the crux of the problem that I have with the system we live in. Our mentality of looking at this as our land, wherever we are, and it doesn't matter, you know, whoever you talk to, they will say wherever they are, this is their land and they will defend it. Not your land. Especially from a religious person who believes in God and believes that God created this place for all humanity, for all God's children. How are you then um, deciding which is yours? I don't, I don't think there is a mandate for from God that we can cut up land and say this is our bit and this is your bit I don't know maybe there is scripture to that I don't know but still even if there is it doesn't it just it doesn't make any sense we we're lucky to be alive all of us but we're not counting our blessings we're deciding to be greedy and possessive by and and you know taking a bit of land and saying this is ours and we're only going to care for this bit of land and and you can care for your side and and as it grows and then take advantage and exploit the financial situation, you know, of man-made construct of money, and trade and things. I don't know. <laughs> Silly, isn't it? Fighting over something you can't contain. And all you're containing is a bit of land which you don't have control over. The suited people have control over. A few people in your in in the millions that live there have control of that so basically it's just who do you want to control you this set of people or this set of people hmm. good evening thanks for joining us the hamas run health ministry in gaza says at least 50 people have been killed in an attack on a school in the north of the territory the united nations run al fakora school in the jabalia camp which has been targeted it also claims a second school has been attacked. So far, the Israeli Defence Forces have not commented on the allegations. Well, these are the latest pictures of one of those reported attacks. Sky News has been able to verify and geolocate the video as being from the UN school at the Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza. Well, let's take a look at some of the key developments across the region today, as we've been hearing. According to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health in Gaza, at least 50 people have been killed in what they claim was an Israeli attack on the UN-run al fakora school in Jabalia refugee camp. The IDF says it's investigating the reports. Hospitals across northern Gaza are struggling to remain open. Israel has said two fuel trucks will be allowed to enter Gaza each day, but officials say more is needed for humanitarian operations. Al-Shifa, Gaza's largest hospital and a primary target of the ground assault, is currently being evacuated, but it's not clear where people are heading. The focus, though, may soon turn to Kyle Nunes in the south, which could now become the new front in Israel's operation. The IDF has put out a statement on social media today urging Palestinians in the area to move further south to the safe zone, al Mawazi. Well, let's get the latest from Jerusalem with our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bungle. Well, the images that we have seen are dreadful. Uh, the bodies of babies, toddlers, teenagers, women, all, we assume, seeking shelter in the school because schools, of course, like hospitals, are seen uh, and hoped as safe spaces in, in any conflict zone, but particularly in Gaza at the moment. This is the United Nations run school which would one would have hoped given it a sort of greater degree of protection uh, we understand that at least 50 people have been killed that is the figure at least according to the health ministry in gaza what we don't know and we have to be very clear about is uh, who was responsible for this i have spoken to the israeli defense forces and asked them for a statement they say that they are looking into it and investigating the incident there have been occasions, not just during this war, but in the past, many occasions where rockets fired by Hamas or the smaller militant group in the Gaza Strip, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, have failed and fallen short. So in that respect, we shouldn't rush to any conclusions. Uh, but what is quite evident is that a place that was supposed to be safe uh, from the bombing uh, has become uh, a place of great devastation where many lives have been lost. 
Alistair Bunkle uh, for us in Jerusalem. Well, we've just had a response from the UNICEF Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa, Adel Kodor. This is what he says. The scenes of carnage and death following the attacks on Al Fakora and Tal Al Zatar schools in Gaza, killing many children and women, are horrific and appalling. The statement goes on to say these horrible attacks should cease immediately. Children, schools and shelters are not a target. Immediate ceasefire needed uh, now. We're still waiting for verification, of course, as to uh, the cause of those uh, reported deaths. Um, and uh, the IDF still say they are uh, investigating. Well, a short time ago, I spoke to Israel's leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid. Uh, we'll hear what he had to say in a moment. Uh, these are latest pictures, though, as Gazans flee from uh, the hospital at the centre of the Israel-Hamas war, the Al-Shifa. We've seen people uh, waving white flags as those Palestinians flee Gaza City on foot amid gunfire, also heavy Israeli military deployment after the Israeli army ordered the evacuation of the Al-Shifa hospital. Uh, more than 2,000 patients, medics and displaced people, we understand, uh, were trapped by the war between Israel and Hamas. These are the latest pictures that have been uh, coming in to us. Well, let's speak. To, let's hear from the leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid, who spoke to me earlier. I mean, this is a Hamas report, and uh, we have all failed, or at least the international media has failed miserably with, with former Hamas reports. The Shifa Hospital report is, of course, the one everybody still remembers, I hope. Um, so let's, and we are, all, of course, we are suffering from the fact that we are a democracy, a law-abiding democracy that needs to check the facts before it, we're going on air with it. So, of course, Israel is doing everything it can in order to avoid harming the innocent. And we have no war with the children of Gaza. We have a war with Hamas who's using the children of Gaza as human shield. And I pray to God that uh, uh, this report, like so many before it, uh, who came from Hamas, uh, <laughs> will, will turn out to be false. What about the situation at uh, Al-Shifa Hospital? Uh, we heard reports that the IDF uh, had ordered those remaining in the hospital to evacuate immediately. The IDF are saying that that isn't the case. In fact, they're helping people move. Do you know what the situation is at the moment there? Yeah, you know, there was an interesting report today in the New York Times of a British doctor who said there is a shaft of six floors going underneath uh, the Shifa hospital. Uh, these are, I mean, because Hamas has made the hospital into the terror hub. And this is part of the reality that we are facing and we need to fight. We are, of course, doing our best to make sure that doctors and patients alike are being evacuated from, from uh, uh, danger zones. Uh, Do you continue then to support the war's objectives? And are you happy with how this war is being conducted? Well, first and foremost, the most important thing for all of us is the return home of 239 people who are being held hostages in, in, in the terror tunnels of Hamas. If Hamas will control Gaza when this is over, what happened to us in October the 7th will happen again. This so you're backing the Prime saying. Minister in, in his objectives then, because everything you've just said is exactly what Netanyahu is saying must happen. Netanyahu and myself and every other Israeli in his right mind, yes. We can have our arguments about how to conduct or, or how to manage those directives, but we, we are in, in the, we are, we're in the same direction in terms of, of what is it that but we you're, need. But you're calling for him to resign, so how can you back him on the one hand and say everything he's doing is correct in terms of the war, and on the other hand saying he has to go and he has to go now? Well. Uh, you know what, this, is, this only comes as an example to the fact that Israel is, after all, a democracy. And a vibrant and a vital democracy that has, like all other democracies, arguments within it. I'm not going to get into this in international media, but this is for all those of us who do not remember what Israel is about. This is what Israel is about. We can fight the just war that we are fighting and have our democratic, democratic debates um, in between. Opposition leader Yair Lupert speaking to me uh, a little earlier. Well, thousands of family members of hostages held in Gaza have marched into Jerusalem today to demand action from the Israeli government to 
get help for those held by Hamas. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, reports. Six weeks of anguish, five days of marching, has brought the families of those taken to Gaza from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, joined by thousands of supporters, demanding Israel's prime minister meets them. Uh, it should have not have required a march of 80 kilometers with people suffering and families suffering only in order to get a meeting with a prime minister. Among the crowd, Shelly Shemtov, whose 21-year-old son, Omer, was taken by Hamas at the music so festival near Gaza that day. It's 43 days of nightmare. We don't sleep, we don't eat. I don't know what about my son, if he's uh, eating, if they are giving him food, if they are beating him. I don't know nothing. It's nightmare. Is this helping, coming here, marching here? very much it's 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 a power i i don't know if you, you, you see all the people they are giving us power they were here with a message for the israeli government moran mina whose grandmother is being held says it should have only one mission in gaza the message is that there will be no victory we already lost we have 240 people in Gaza, we need to bring them all back, and this is our victory. In a moment of haunting poignancy, they release balloons, one for every hostage missing. Israel is a very small country. Everybody seems to know somebody who was affected by the events of October the 7th, directly or indirectly, whether they were killed or wounded or taken hostage. There is a very somber feeling to this march, a real sense of sadness and deep pain, but also a determination that their voices are heard both inside the Israeli government and far beyond. The march only adds to the pressure on Israel's beleaguered prime minister. Our prime minister doesn't belong here. <laughs> Sorry. He, he, he lost his credit long ago. And what happened in the past year is horrible. And it led to these events. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Netanyahu should go home. Their quest to bring the hostages home for now has no end in sight. Optimism about a hostage deal waning now, with signs of Israel's Gaza offensive deepening. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Jerusalem. Well, back here, protests have taken place in cities across the country with pro-Palestinian demonstrators holding a day of national action. The protests took the form of more than 100 smaller rallies at various locations around the UK. As Sky's Becky Johnson now reports. One, two, three, four. Large pro-Palestinian crowds gathered in cities and towns across the UK. From Leeds to Wolverhampton, we are all Bristol to Oxford. While up in Glasgow, the weather didn't stop hundreds turning out. In London, there was anger with politicians at several demonstrations held around the capital. What do we want? What do we want? It seemed like they're deaf. They don't want to hear anything, or they can't see what's going on. All of us as a community want a ceasefire, and no one's listening. Six weeks on from the atrocities committed by Hamas in Israel, these pro-Palestinian demonstrations continue to attract large numbers. People who do not support the government or the opposition for backing Israel's response. In Tower Hamlets, some Labour voters said they now feel politically homeless. I think that Keir Starmer has um, condoned genocide in his words. And I left the Labour Party last week. I left the Labour Party last week. I can't vote for Labour anymore. After a difficult week for the Labour leader, with several of his MPs resigning over his refusal to call for a ceasefire, there was anger from protesters in his London constituency. Shame on you, Keir Starmer, shame on you. We do need to have public accountability for MPs' actions because the actions that they are condoning or, you know, allowing for to happen in other parts of the world brings the question of what would they allow to happen to us over here. 
But as police watched on around the country, many joined in a chant that's widely perceived to be an anti-Semitic demand for the destruction of Israel. From the river to the sea! Do you think Israel had a right to defend itself after what happened on I October can't 7th? speak for uh, the state of Israel. I don't think they have the right to bomb occupied territory. I don't think they have the right to occupy. It's a view that's widely held by the many thousands who've taken to the streets, and a view that's impossible to reconcile with the position of both the UK government and the opposition. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Tower Hamlets. Sky's Molly Malone joins me now from Waterloo Station in central London. Molly, many of the protesters ended up at the station. What happened? They did, yeah. Um, protesters were here staging what's become known as re in recent weeks as uh, a sit-in, where they basically sit and block train station concourses. I was inside Waterloo Station pretty much uh, as it was happening and saw a long line of uh, police officers ushering people out to chance of shame on you. Now, the police did eventually move protesters on. They made their way across Westminster Bridge, where police say they did sit in the road momentarily but quickly moved on. They did make five arrests and they were able to do this because British Transport Police essentially expected this sort of disruption to happen and they sought the consent of the Transport Secretary Mark Harper in advance, uh, uh, consent under Section 14A of the Public Order Act, which basically means that police are able to, if they see what they deem significant disruption, they're able to detain people and arrest people as they see necessary. That order will stay in place across 10 stations, train stations here in London tonight until around 11 o'clock. I think in terms, as, as protests go, it won't have surprised the police. It's exactly the type of disruption that they expect to see. But I think once again, it just serves to illustrate uh, the strength of feeling among protesters as they seek to make their presence known. Molly in central London, thank you. Now, the world's biggest rocket has... So, I don't know. I mean, there's a few things I wanted to pick up from that. The first is, <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, what labels we put on ourselves, you know, Israel, Palestine, whatever. Look at how all these, the leaders of all these countries and organisations deal with things. And look at, you know, when us people who, who think we're in a democracy where, you know, we have some say and power only every four or five years and only on the people that are given to us, um, which is usually just two old men <laughs> um, around the world, um, you get to choose this old man or this old man. Which one do you want? And that's democracy. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, it's clever how we've been brainwashed into that, isn't it? To think that, you know, we're so free. Are we? Are you free? Free to go roam wherever you want on a free planet where everything was free in the first place? And now you have to pay for everything? And you need a piece of paper to go somewhere? Anyway, not to do with that. But the, the, what's interesting is you see these world leaders, these suited people, you know, they don't. They're not doing what's best for all of us and they ignore the majority of us when we say something unless it's what they want to hear or what they want to do and then they're fine they will yeah, they're fine with that but if you don't say something you don't want to hear well, they just ignore it and it's very difficult then for protest actually to make any any stance any you know like in, in israel they had to march for a whole week so they could get a meeting today with benjamin netanyahu their prime minister I mean, maybe they could have got a meeting, I don't know. I mean, I'm taking their word for that. But it, it's sometimes it is difficult when you're ignored. And that's why people do more extreme things like sit-ins and chaining themselves up like the suffragettes did. You know, like other people throughout history have had to do because just standing there waving a flag or, or with a piece of paper, you can have millions of people like you did in, uh, against the Iraq and Afghanistan war and it didn't make no difference. You can do it like in France, where they did it for months, uh, protesting, I think, was it because of the economy or something, um, setting fire to things and all sorts, riots in places, and it still didn't make any difference. <laughs> because the, the people that you vote in don't really care what you say. 
Not really, do they? Like, well, I suppose they couldn't anyway, in, in because there's so many people. You know, everyone it was it never the train shall meet. There's never going to be a, a consensus. I mean, surely some things there would be consensus. Like we all want to live in peace, and we all want to live a nice one existence. But even those things, some people don't want to agree on. And then also this the from the river song. I, I've seen other people post things on Facebook saying in 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 the Netherlands it was granted a a, um, a right of a, a protest song, and it's not uh, anti-Semitic. I don't know anything about the song or its history, but from what I've heard, the idea of it, um, it I could see how uh, Jewish people would maybe read that quite rightly as as uh, anti-Semitic. So if you're protesting, why sing it at all? I don't get it. This is what I don't get about humans in general. You know, you want to st- have the moral high ground. You want to get people on your side. Don't sing that song. It's, it's, it, even if you believe it's questionable, even if you believe that when you're singing it, it's because you're just chanting Free Palestine or whatever, and it's just a, a, it lyrically matches or something, or it's from one part to the other part, and it's not like the eradication of Israel. But I suspect a lot of people, because we do know, you know, in, in, in unfortunately, human beings, there's lots of racist and xenophobic human beings. We all know that in lots of different areas. It's not just uh, uh, Israel, uh, Jews, it's not just, uh, there's Muslims, there's uh, people of colour, there's all sorts of you know, homosexuals, there's all sorts of trans, there's all sorts of people that some people won't like. And they will say these things because they want to get that hate out. But we shouldn't have that hate. It should be love for all, hatred for none, as the Andy Muslims say. That's that's the way we should be. But the problem is, is we've been, you know, we, we all start as babies without any of this hate. And we've got to remember that. When you, when all, every baby, you know, every baby started off um, pure, without any of these hatred. It was taught or learnt or decided upon eventually by the person. And maybe they have to be judged for that. But... We've got to remember, if we started off as babies clean, then why did, how do we get to this stage where we can hate? You know, if you think, say, Hitler, how do you get to that stage where baby Hitler was a pure baby, just like any other baby, who may have played with Jewish babies or or whoever, gypsies, and wouldn't notice, no, it would have played, you know, just like it was an Aryan baby in in his eyes. Would have played completely no difference, no hate, because babies don't have hate. Babies play with each other and they love each other and they laugh and they kiss. Where did it become where that changed? And not just, you know, no, no, just picking that name. There's loads of names you can pick out. You know, don't even have to be famous, you know. There's loads of this. Where did it come from? Because we all know that we didn't all start off like that. So that shows there's a failing in our system, a systematic failure of humanity and the way we govern ourselves and the way we allow it to to flourish. If I can think about it, why haven't the greatest minds in the world already sorted this problem out? Why haven't we taught this out of ourselves? Unless there's a reason to keep it in that those in power or those people don't really care about having, they don't mind having these this hatred still flourishing because they can use that and galvanise it. I don't know. It's just so sad, you know? It's just so sad that we live in this world where it can flourish, that we can hate each other and we can do things that we know, we know. Like when people sing that song, that, that maybe some people sing that song from the river, you know, just because it lyrically matches or it's a protest song or whatever, But there will be people who sing that song with the intention of they know what they mean by it. What what, what do they get out of that? What do human beings get out of this this thing that doesn't do anything? It just hurts another human being, your fellow brother and sister. We're meant to count on each other because you never know who you have to rely upon. This world that we live ourselves on hasn't just been built by one set of people has been built by all of us 
and it will continue to be built by all of us. So how stupid to sort of try and shove yourself into a box, but that's the system we live in that does that, cuts up bits of land and says you're this and you're that, and you should, you know, be patriotic, and you should wave your flag and defend your country. <laughs> I don't know. It's ludicrous, isn't it? Absolutely ludicrous. Okay, let's go to the next one now. Hello again, welcome back. Let's return then to the situation in the Middle East. The Director General of the World Health Organization has confirmed that 31 premature babies have been evacuated from Gaza's main Al Shifa hospital and are being transferred to a neonatal unit in Egypt. Well, joining me now is UNICEF Chief of Communications and Partnerships, Toby Fricker. Good to see you, Toby. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, can you update us then on this operation? Just how difficult was it to get these babies out of the hospital? Yeah, I mean, I mean, extremely difficult. Um, you know, it's working through the intense hostilities that are ongoing uh, to, to reach the hospital. And then the conditions inside the hospital are, are, are catastrophic, as they were described by UN colleagues as a, as a death zone. Um, thankfully, the operation uh, worked well. And these 31 premature babies now are in a better condition in a hospital in, in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. I mean, there is nowhere safe, fully safe in the Gaza Strip, but they are getting... Uh, care now they're being uh, stabilized uh, they're very sick babies um, but at, at least they have made it there the health authorities in at the Al Shifa hospital had requested you know this assistance and and we were able to to provide that you know working with partners uh, but the doctors medical personnel are, are extraordinary heroes you know at the Al Shifa and, and other hospitals across the Gaza Strip but at least we've managed these 31 premature babies now hopefully can survive and, and get the care that they urgently need. Uh, and the plan is still to eventually move them into Egypt. Is that right? When, when might that happen? Yeah, I mean, I don't have all the exact specifics, to be honest, in terms of the next steps. The, the priority right now is really just to stabilise the, the babies where they are now at the hospital uh, down in the south part of the Gaza Strip. Uh, because the Al Shifa, as you know, has been come under such intense hostilities. They've had a lack of fuel, a lack of water. Um, the conditions have been ter deteriorating by the day. So this operation was was an urgent operation. There, there were 32 babies identified the day before. Unfortunately, one of them uh, tragically died, but at least we managed to get there today uh, to, to move the, the 31 who were still there. Yeah, and, and am I right in saying that the parents of, of some of those babies are missing? Yeah, so UNICEF you know, and partners, we're working now to try and um, identify you know, and, and trace them, parents or family members. It's part of a, a normal response in conflict that we do for unaccompanied, separated children, to do whatever we can to identify, trace and then reunify children. Of course, it's extremely difficult in the conditions right now, but we're working with partners to try and do that and try and find out where are the parents, where are the caregivers, where are extended family potentially to make that connection. And that really is urgent work as well. And that, and that goes on right now. We know there are that many, many children, uh, young people in the Gaza Strip who are unaccompanied. The numbers are hard to, to really quantify, but it, that, that work is critical, but the conditions have made it extremely difficult so far. The hospital director says that he was ordered to evacuate Al Shifa. The IDF says the director called for the evacuation. Do, do you know uh, exactly what happened? No, I mean, what I can say is the, you know, the health authorities are in touch and we've been trying to support them as best we can because they've been doing an extraordinary job uh, given the situation they're working in, these horrific conditions. Um, and, it, and it's really, you know, they are, they are really heroes in terms of what they've been trying to do to save children's lives, civilians' lives. You know, as UNICEF, as a humanitarian organisation, we keep reminding all parties to the conflict to do whatever they can to protect civilian objects, which means hospitals, it means your know, water plants, it means the services that children need to survive and live off. Um, and that's absolutely critical. We keep doing that work. We keep pushing for the better protection of children, civilians and hospitals and for the, the re immediate re unconditional release of the Israeli children who are still abducted, being held hostage inside the Gaza Strip. 
Yeah, um, in the last few minutes, um, Toby, the IDF have uh, revealed uh, video evidence of what they say is a significant 55 metre long tunnel, 10 metres underneath uh, Al Shifa Hospital, um, in what they say was an intelligence based operation. They say that it's evidence uh, that Hamas were using the hospital, using the patients inside it as, as human shields. Um, does that evidence justify, do you think? emptying the hospital in this way? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me to, to comment on those, um, those reports. Um, but what I can say is hospitals have special protection you know, in, uh, during conflict. And it's absolutely critical that all parties do whatever they can to best protect children, civilians who need urgent care. We know now that in the Gaza Strip, uh, two thirds of hospitals are not operational. Um, and this is at a time of crisis, even in peacetime, that's a disaster. But at a time of crisis now, when you have thousands of civilians, thousands of children injured who need critical care, you, you need the hospitals working you know, the best they can. And then at the same time, you have children civilians with other health conditions that, that need to be treated as well. Um, so there's multiple issues around this. And we also have winter approaching. We have 1.6 million displaced people living in very densely populated shelters and children very much at risk then of being exposed to other diseases, waterborne diseases. Safe water is very, very limited, around three litres per day. So there's a multiple factors that are now piling on top of each other and we're trying to you know, prevent another catastrophe upon, another, upon this disaster so far. Well, it's good news that uh, those babies at least have all been transported uh, safely. Toby Fricker from UNICEF, uh, thank you very much for the updates. Okay, let's... Uh, what a world we live in, huh? What a world we live in. Yeah. On the Monday... and ceremony at the Cenotaph to honour the contributions of Jewish servicemen and women. Meanwhile, a series of events are taking place right around the country, marking Mitzvah Day, the UK's largest faith-based day of social action. In central London, British Jewish groups will call for a ceasefire in the Middle East. Joining us now live is Naama Ten Brink, spokesperson for Naama, uh, British Jews Against Occupation. Good to have you on the programme uh, today. Uh, will you be at uh, any of these uh, events today? Yes, we've organised our uh, demonstration today after uh, the memorial to give a chance for members of our community to attend both, if they wish. Um, I've been deeply involved in organising our demonstration as part of NAMOD, which is a movement of Jews in the UK who care deeply about what's happening in Israel-Palestine and have been organising for years to mobilise their community to oppose the occupation and apartheid in Israel-Palestine. Today we're organising... Uh, organisation, do you see, uh, do you witness events playing out right now? Well, um, all of us feel that it's absolutely an imperative now to call for an immediate ceasefire and a hostage exchange and an end to the siege, which has been an unprecedented and punitive intensification of the 16 years blockade that has already been imposed on Gaza. Um, none of us believe that further escalation of the kind of wanton destruction and devastation we are seeing in, in Gaza uh, is going to make anyone safer. Um, we also must remember that meanwhile under the cover of this war, um, settlers and the military have been escalating their attacks on Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, where we've seen um, over 16 communities forcibly uh, displaced. Um, we are calling uh, on, we believe that only a significant international pressure at this point will uh, pull the Israeli government back from the destructive path mm -hmm. it's taking. And, and it's quite an interesting viewpoint you have got. It seems to be largely in defence of, of, of Palestinians under occupation. Well, I think that um, all of us in the Jewish community, of course, were absolutely horrified by the criminal and heinous attacks that Hamas conducted on October 7th. Um, but we have to remember that uh, prior to October 7th, uh, Palestinians were facing years of dispossession and um, the, the policy and the model of Netanyahu's approach to this um, conflict has been a quote-unquote conflict management policy, which um, really has failed to keep anybody safe. Um, years of marginalizing and co-opting the Palestinian Authority and empowering Hamas within the Gaza Strip um, has really truly failed and we're seeing even again yesterday him reiterate 
his reluctance to allow the Palestinian Authority to return, uh, to, to take control over the West Bank. So we don't see what the end game is in further escalating um, military hostility. So, 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 sorry, sorry what, are you saying in effect that a lot of this crisis has been caused by Netanyahu? Well, I think that um, attempting to bury any political horizon for Palestinians for so many years um, has been a deeply destructive policies for both Israelis and Palestinians. Um, Palestinians face uh, daily, prior to this uh, current um, escalation, it was already the deadliest year for Palestinians. There were um, over 200 dead. Um, so I think that allowing this Israeli government um, to continue such policies with impunity is really endangering the future of everyone in the reason, in the region. And it's um, returning to years of, of repeated bombardments um, rather than um, sincerely engaging in, in a process of political engagement that would provide equality and freedoms and a chance to, um, for a future uh, for the people. Israel will say, won't it, that it needs to tighten its stranglehold to, to get rid of Hamas, that is its main aim. So there's uh, no reason for it, certainly right now, to end any kind of blockade or, or occupation. Well, I think that you can't hold uh, over two million civilians responsible for the atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. Um, this has been um, widely decried as a form of collective punishment to deny civilians basic supplies um, to, to life-sustaining goods, to food, to medicine, to water. We've seen hospitals laid siege to. These should be sites for preserving life. Um, none of this really is explicable by an attempt to, quote-unquote, eradicate Hamas. Um, I would really question the realistic, um, how realistic it is to expect that you can defeat um, an organization that is deeply embedded in the civilian population who has been denied basic rights for years. If you can use military force alone to eradicate it, I don't think you can defeat an ideology through the barrel of a gun. Um, I think the only... Uh, viable solution is to uh, change the conditions in which such ideologies uh, flourish. I don't, and this kind of total devastation, um, depopulation of the north of Gaza, we're extremely worried about the over 1.6 million Palestinians who are now internal refugees in the Gaza Strip. There's no talk of their return um, of future plans for reconstruction. It's the largest displacement of Palestinians since 1948. We've rightly spoken about the Jewish trauma that was evoked by the horrifying massacres on October 6th, but for Palestinians to see uh, this mass force displacement again reminds them of their own families who have been made refugees um, twice over now, who have... Um, we, sorry, time has beaten us, but I uh, appreciate you coming on to the programme and uh, giving us your thoughts. Now I'm a 10 brink. Uh, nice to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. What did time beat them for? Uh, right, let's have a look at the weather. The weather. How many times they're going to use that? Huh? Oh, it's, it, it's ten twenty-eight. He could have carried on talking if he wanted to. Well, did, he didn't like what she was saying, but she was saying, you know, quite mildly peaceful, clever things, and that's what's interesting about these pursuits of the truth, and why I think I highlight certain people. Um, hopefully, not too biased, but. When you see the leaders, how they speak, and when you see the like real people, the actual people, how they speak, there's such a, a wide difference. Where does that get lost when power comes into play? Here's the next one. Gaza says 31 premature babies who have been evacuated from Gaza's main Al-Shifa hospital this morning and will be transferred to Egypt. The World Health Organization has described the site of the hospital as a death zone after being permitted by the Israel Defense Forces to undertake a humanitarian assessment. The teams from the United Nations and the World Health Organization said they discovered a desperate situation at the hospital. Currently, there are at least 250 patients still being treated by 25 medical staff. On the hour-long visit, the teams witnessed a mass grave at the entrance of the hospital with more than 80 people buried inside. And they concluded by saying the hospital has essentially stopped functioning as a medical facility. Meanwhile, the Sky News team inside Gaza filmed the aftermath of an attack on a school in the northern part of the Strip. These images show the destruction following the attack on Tal al-Zatar school in the city of Beit Lahaya. The team on the ground say that dozens of people are still trapped inside the rubble as the rescue effort continues. 
Let's talk live to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who is in Jerusalem. So these babies being moved from Al Shifa, Dominic, as the World Health Organization issues this damning assessment on what is going on at the hospital. Yeah, the WHO is very worried about the situation in Al, in Al Shifa, and it said the patients and uh, staff there were terrified and um, pleading to be evacuated. So, so the first uh, bar- part of the evacuation has been completed, it, it seems, with these at least 30 uh, critically ill babies transferred out of the Gaza Strip from Al Shifa to a field hospital being run by the Emirates um, just outside Gaza in the Sinai Desert uh, in Egypt. Uh, we understand now from the, uh, the Hamas-run Gazan uh, health ministry that uh, their parents or their relatives were able to travel with them as well, uh, unless they could find no family to accompany uh, the babies. Now, that leaves um, as many as 300 other patients, and they are very vulnerable. They are, for instance, patients on dialysis machines or patients with uh, wounds uh, and severe trauma. Uh, from the war and then I guess that something has to be done to help them as well Um, and it has to be said that you know until a week or so ago our chief hospital was a sanctuary for thousands of Gazans trying to escape uh, the Israeli uh, military onslaught um, and also had hundreds of patients there and then as as the Israelis moved in um, uh, patients were encouraged to uh, evacuate and now we have a situation where the WHO says it is effectively a death zone. That's referring not just to the sort of mass grave outside where they say 70, 70 to 80 bodies uh, were buried, but also uh, the fact that a, a number of patients have died uh, because of the impact of that Israeli military operation in, in recent days. Um, and I think the point to make here, Nick, is that Al Shifa has been in existence since 1946. Uh, uh, It has been the backbone of Gaza's health system for decades, and now the WHO says it has ceased to operate effectively as a hospital. So that that is happening at a time when the the area is facing a a deepening humanitarian crisis with the UN warning of starvation and others warning of the possibility of a mass outbreak of uh, diseases that could kill many people and a lot of concern about food and fuel and water supplies. So it's contributing to a deepening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, while you're there, Dominic, tell us about these intense talks to possibly release some hostages. Well, there is a sign and there are reports, and it's, it's sounding increasingly optimistic now of progress in these negotiations over the face of the hostages being held uh, in Gaza. Um, it seems that from the Qataris, who are mediating between Israel on one side and Hamas on the other, that there is progress towards some kind of a breakthrough. They're saying that the obstacles that remain to uh, a bro- uh, a progress towards a, a breakthrough are minor. Uh, they say, and it seems to be focusing more on the numbers of women and children that the Palestinians wish to exchange uh, on one side and the Israelis to offer in in return on the other. So the Israelis say there are 70 women and children in Gaza. The Palestinians say there are more likely to be 50, and they're having trouble finding out where they all are, and they they will need more time to bring them in to hand them over. They want to have exchanged uh, in return for them 150 women and children on the uh, other side being held by the Israelis, so Palestinian women and children being held by the Israelis. Um, so there's that obstacle that the Qataris seem to be thinking is uh, is being overcome at the moment. But also there are, it seems reportedly, at least in the Israeli press, divisions in the Israeli uh, military and government about how long the ceasefire can go on for and whether this is the right time to give the enemy a break. So what, what we're hearing is the possibility of an exchange of between 50 and 70 hostages on the uh, Israeli side being held by Palestinians in return for 150 on the other uh, during what could be a three to five day ceasefire, which will obviously change the dynamic in this war um, dramatically. All right, Dominic, let us know what happens. Many thanks indeed for now, Dominic Waghorn in Jerusalem. I just want to bring you a breaking line here from uh, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, head of the World Health Organization, who has uh, uh, posted on social media on X to say the World Health Organization has led a second UN and Palestinian Red Crescent Society mission to Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza under what he calls extremely intense and high-risk security conditions. 31 very sick babies were evacuated, as we know, but in addition to that, uh, along with uh, six health workers and 10 family or staff family members. Uh, The baby is taken to 
El Halal El Amirati Maternity Hospital, which uh, Dominic was telling us there where they are receiving urgent care in the neonatal intensive care unit. So Dr. Tedros says further missions are being planned to urgently transport remaining patients and health staff out of Al Shifa pending guarantees of safe passage by parties to the conflict. We are deeply moved in his words and impressed by what he calls the extraordinary bravery and service of health workers in Gaza who continue to serve under the most dire and difficult circumstances. So that is from Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, head of the World Health Organization, confirming that 31 very sick babies were evacuated. Now, as I was uh, bringing that to you, we have had a comment in from the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights uh, on uh, the Gaza situation, Volker Turk. Um, some strong language here saying the horrendous events of the past 48 hours in Gaza, beggar belief. The killing of so many people at schools turned shelters, hundreds fleeing for their lives from Al Shifa Hospital amid continuing displacement of hundreds of thousands in southern Gaza are actions which fly in the face of the basic protections civilians must be afforded under international law. Images purportedly taken in the aftermath of the reported Israeli strike on al Fakura's school, that UN school, uh, are horrifying, clearly showing large numbers of women, children and men severely wounded or killed. At least three other schools hosting displaced Palestinians have also been attacked in the past 48 hours. Israeli military operations have been continuing inside and around Al-Shifa Hospital. UN colleagues visited the site yesterday and witnessed firsthand what uh, they described as a, a death zone. Medical, this is very strong language, medical personnel, patients and civilians have fled the hospital, ordered to do so by the Israeli military. Hundreds were seen making their way south on foot at great risk to their lives, health and safety, and to where nowhere is safe in Gaza. Uh, let's join Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, the Israeli Defence Forces International Spokesperson, live here on Sky News. Uh, good to have you on the programme, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, this afternoon. Um, so, uh, damning assessment there from the UN High Commissioner on uh, Human Rights, uh, who is talking about um, confirming or seeming to confirm that uh, the Israeli military ordered this evacuation from Al Shifa yesterday? No, yesterday we evacuated people from the Al Shifa hospital in coordination, like we did the babies today at the request of the administration of, of the hospital. Um, that is what we've been uh, doing. You know, we had uh, requested for several weeks now that the hospital be evacuated. And unfortunately, the uh, uh, different organizations did not deem it possible. And today we proved again that it is possible and where we need to save lives, we need to work together in order to evacuate people from harm's way. That is what we've been doing over the last um, 48 hours now with people from the Shifa compound. The situation in Shifa is a dire situation precisely because where Hamas chose to position itself, chose to uh, instill its terrorist infrastructure. Um, and we have been saying that we are determined to dismantle and destroy Hamas its governing capabilities, but also its terrorist capabilities, and they are using the civilian infrastructure precisely to hide their uh, activities. This is the reality. Well, no, we're hearing certainly from the World Health Organization that this evacuation was ordered. So uh, people have very different accounts of what has happened. We released yesterday, and you could, uh, if you wish, uh, you could... Uh, broadcasted on Sky a conversation between one of our officers and the administrator of the hospital, clearly saying he's asking for an evacuation. So it's an unfortunate, uh, I would say, misrepresentation of the facts, of the reality uh, of what actually happened uh, yesterday and the night before. There's a, bit, a damning assessment, isn't there, from the, the World Health Organization and, and these teams that visited the hospital uh, for an hour talking of a death zone. That is at your door? No, it's not. Unfortunately, we've been asking people to evacuate for the, from the hospital for several weeks. Um, this is the reality. Yeah. The situation is, of course, it is a war zone. And while we're trying to evacuate people from the hospitals or from the northern areas of the Gaza Strip, this is precisely the ability of the role of the UN, of the WHO, to assist in, in their evacuation. But for weeks, they have proven or they determined not to evacuate them. 
So I would say, yes, the situation, it is a war zone. It's a reality with that Hamas chose the battleground. Hamas chose precisely because of this challenge that it, um, that, that it poses to a professional... But, but it's down to the Israeli Defence Forces, isn't it, that there is a mass grave at the entrance to this hospital? Nick, the mass grave is from before the operation on the ground. It's not something that we intended, but there's a reality that Hamas have chosen this. And, and instead of, you know, we've not heard any condemnation by the WHO against Hamas. They haven't even mentioned them. And Hamas, we have to remember, is the governing authority, the governing authority that decided to launch a war on Israel, butchering, murdering and massacring of over 1,200 people and abducting over 240, and, and now it's, that number is updated to 236, precisely because of the bodies that we retrieved from Judith Weiss and um, uh, Noah Marziano, just adjacent to the hospital. So this is precisely the reason. Why are they adjacent to the hospital, we may ask? Because the hospital is central to Hamas's terrorist operations. Uh, Mr. Leonard, under what circumstances were, were these teams allowed in for their brief visit to the hospital? There's an ongoing work relationship between our uh, coordination of government activities in the territories, COGAT, and the international humanitarian organizations operating on the ground. And we have been uh, maintaining these open channels throughout the last six weeks in order to assess the humanitarian situation. So, of course, this is part of the assessment. Um, our activities around the hospital and in the hospital compound are against the terrorist element elements, not against the people of Gaza, not against the people who have taken refuge all the people hospitalized in the compound. The reality is, of course, what a very dire situation, and that is what precisely why we brought 6,000 liters of water. That's why we brought food supplies, humanitarian medical supplies, and also um, incubators for the babies that were evacuated. So there is an, a humanitarian operation that goes hand in hand with the offensive activities against Hamas. So, so, so will you allow regulated access and visits to, to teams in the future then, just, just to check on progress that's being made? Uh, of course, the access to the site, it depends on the operational reality on the ground. I would say that we are open to that, as we proved yesterday and today, uh, that humanitarian activities can be coordinated, but there is a dynamic of terrorist activities, of RPGs being fired at our forces, of people, terrorists um, that are taking refuge within the civilian arena, which jeopardizes the uh, humanitarian mission constantly. This is the uh, challenge. Mr. Mr. Leder, can I, sorry, can I just move on? We haven't got a, a lot of time left. Can I talk about this UN uh, run yeah. school in uh, the refugee camp? Uh, Sky News has uh, seen and uh, reported 50 deaths, scenes of destruction, people that are still trapped under the rubble. You'll know uh, to what I uh, refer. Is that down to an Israeli strike? I can't say at this time. Um, you know, one thing is certain of what we've learned throughout this war is Hamas are very, very quick to determine any reality and we're reporting aut automatically. We are a professional military. We need to review and investigate exactly what happens. At this time, I can't confirm that this is a result of an Israeli strike. It's likely to be, though, isn't it? Why do you say that? Uh, I say that because you were very quick to uh, blame the, the Palestinians, militants, for the uh, destruction, the strike on the Al-Ali hospital on the 17th of October. That came out very, very quickly from Israel. So I'm just wondering why it's taking you so long to work out what's happened here. No, I would be very cautious in coming to any conclusions from one incident to the next just because it appears so. We're investigating it. We're looking into it seriously. You wouldn't expect anything less from us, and we don't expect, expect anything less from ourselves. We have to be 100% certain, and if I can't rule it out, I can't confirm it. And if I can't confirm it, I can't rule it out. So this is a, a reality that we need to take into consideration in the fog of war. And, and while you know, the, the I, I'd say the fundamental difference between what happened in Al-Ahli is there was no ground off offensive at that time. So there's an intensification of operations on the ground and it creates more difficulty to get clarification, especially from forces that are, are, are mobilizing on the ground. So it does require some patience to clarify. And I would say, first of all, we need to be very cautious of being manipulated by Hamas. How long will it take, do you think, then, to, to come to a conclusion as to what happened? Nick, I don't know. I, we have to be very clear. As, long, as soon as we have something we, to announce, we will. Peter Loder, thank you very much indeed for coming on to the programme. Thanks. Good thing. Now here, the Chancellor. Joe. Well, look, he didn't have any chance to go to the weather. He could have spoken to him as long as he wanted. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Right. So, and they, he they said, obviously, grill, the Chancellor... The, uh, the media had... sometimes, don't they? Um, I don't know, it's just... I mean, I know sometimes there, there may be... Well, people have reasons to go to war. But I just listening to all of this and all the previous pursuits of truth of all these events, um, I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's very difficult for me to, to see a, a, a justification for killing human beings. I mean, I know, like, I get it. Yeah, what was done on October the 7th was a massacre and they need to be dealt with. They're not, you know, they're human beings. But I suppose the problem is, is like, like the lady before was talking about the oppression and what it breeds. Like I mentioned before, after the Second World War, what was the reason for Britain and America rebuilding Germany was so that the, um, the fascist movement didn't continue. Because if you leave it in a state, it's going to continue. And now look at Gaza. It looks like well, worse than Syria. Um, it, you know, like heavy building seems to be knocked down. I mean, how much is going to cost to rebuild all that? What a waste of energy and time and money now in the system that, that we live in. But what is it going to do to the mentality of the people there, the children there, that see this and see their loved ones being killed and won't understand maybe the nuances of, you know, that Hamas are bad and the terrorists and they started this. They may not even know that part. All they're going to see is the bombs dropping on their family members and their city where they live in oppression um, destroyed. And what is that going to do? Like, realistically, what is that going to do to that person's mind? And that's why I think it's important that, it, you know, like when George W. Bush, when he went to Iraq, he thought it was about um, winning the, the hearts and minds of people and then just bomb, bomb, bombed. You, you can't. I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing, like... I don't know, maybe because I'm a pacifist, you know, Doctor Who fan, who doesn't believe in violence, doesn't see the merit of it. And I, I, I think that's why sometimes I find it difficult to, to believe the military when I hear them talk, because I know the military, they've already given, like I've said before, that's their, their thing, is to accept that people are going to die, and that's just part of war, as he was um, the IDF uh, military person was saying. That the interesting thing I thought was about the tunnels, because now they're showing... Um, tunnels that they found and this is proof of why they had to go into the hospital and why because they had to they have to have a claim of making the whole hospital a military place for them to be able to do what they did to evacuate it or to do whatever operation they're doing in there um so they're showing tunnels but like michael clark is it the sky analyst said that the tunnels were built by israel um and, and I, I just wanted to read that bit out because i you know i don't always trust what i hear so i had to go and um Google search it. Oh, let's do it now. So if I just Google search um, Al Shifa tunnels by Israel. Uh, oh, that was probably not the best way. Um, uh, before I did get a thing before. Um, Oh, yeah. Did Israel build bunkers and tunnels under Al Shifa, and if so, why? Um, oh, they actually. Um, oh, okay. So someone's actually talking about the. Um, in 1980, Israel renovated, and this is the Hebrew Wikipedia on Shifa Hospital. In the 1980s, Israel renovated and expanded the hospital complex with American assistance. Among other things, the project was managed by the coordinator of government operations in the territories. Shemur Goran, sorry if I mispronounced that, included the construction of an underground concrete floor, a new dialysis wing inaugurated in August 1989, a new six-story wing inaugurated in December 1990. Uh, okay, that doesn't really say very much here. So maybe it's not. Um, I should have googled this first. Um, did Israel build tunnels under Al Shifa? This is the oh, this electronic intifada. It says New York Times reported the Israel intelligence chief Yuval Diskin in a report to the Israeli cabinet said that Gaza-based leadership of Hamas was an underground housing beneath the number two building of the Al Shifa Hospital 
large and grave, the allegation cannot be confirmed. Uh, da, da, da. Back in 1983, when Israel still ruled Gaza, they built a secure underground operating room and a tunnel network beneath Al Shifa Hospital, which is one among several reasons why Israeli security sources are so sure there is a main Hamas command bunk in or around the large cement basement beneath the area of Building Two of the hospital. Tablet added. Not sure what tablet is. I assume it's some kind of. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, Michael Clark on Sky News referred that I don't know maybe just the same kind of Google search and it's come up but I don't know if it's verified or not it's a shame that no one's uh, asking that question because obviously if there was already built tunnels and they're showing us tunnels that doesn't necessarily mean that these are um, Hamas tunnels because they were already built there and obviously if they were already built there then we're going to find them um, I mean if they've been extended that's a different matter and if then when they find you know weapons and military plans and people in there and hostages then that's another thing but I guess they've been in the hospital for a few days I would have thought they've gone through the tunnels by now um, I don't know it depends how expansive they are would they have used a tunnel that was if it was built by the Israelis and they knew about it would they actually have used that but then I don't know but anyway this doesn't really have any any bearing on the thing is the hospital is a hospital and that's the problem when yes it's against international law and wrong for Hamas to endanger all those people and if they cared about Palestinians and human beings lives they would never have put themselves under a hospital I can see the military reason why they did but it's uh, against international law and against the people you say you're fighting for and of course the people should understand that you can't let someone endanger your life. But this is what always happens with these leaders, and especially military, hiding in bunkers, hiding in tanks, hiding in aeroplanes. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't, I guess I just don't like war. I don't like the idea of it. It just doesn't, just killing people, just ending, ending their one existence. But I know, like, in the world we live in, we have lots of bad people and what do we do with them and it's not always so easy just to you know do an SAS type thing and go in there and round them all up and stick them in prison you know and especially if there were people in the hospital and Hamas decide to blow it up and then they kill everyone and they blame it on Israel and then all those babies and people in the hospital um, die so maybe there is a reason why you would evacuate a hospital but I guess the problem is is the problem, like with this, when you talked about bringing water, I mean, the problem is, is the siege aspect. That's the big problem. Once that was done, it was very difficult to come back from that because you can't say, yeah, yeah, okay, I brought loads of water for you, but you're the ones who turned it off for three, four, five weeks. And of course, suffering. And the people in that hospital, the patients in that hospital, you know, assuming there's not Hamas ones and they're mostly, you know, non combatants, they're in that hospital because the bombs, I assume, dropped. You know, there may be ones for renal and cancer and things like that that were been there anyway. But a lot of those people that were in there were because of shrapnel and because of bombs um, that were dropped on, you know, too close to civilian uh, civilians. So I don't know, it's just, that it's very difficult. I suppose, I suppose the thing is, with this war, is being televised. Um, you know, the cameras are seeing these atrocities that we, you know, when I watch Platoon, you know, after watching John Mills and all those types of people making war films and, you know, it's all like, you know, a person gets cut, uh, shot and there's no blood and they die instantly and there's no pain and all that. When I saw Platoon, you know, it was like, whoa, this is what war's really like. It is nasty, it is horrible, it is painful. Why are we doing this to each other? It's not heroic. They're like I um, quoted James Blunt's "No Bravery," you know, in the, in the, one of the titles of *The Pursuit of Truth*, and that's what this we're seeing this because we saw like in Iraq and Afghanistan, but not to the same extent we're seeing in 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 Gaza. We're seeing the 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 babies, the the children, the hospitals full up, the rubble everywhere. We're seeing it, even though we may not be seeing the same bombs and explosions we saw at the landscape or horizon of Iraq and Afghanistan. 
but we're seeing the actual human devastation uh, um, on the media. I don't think we've ever seen it like that before, and that's probably why it has galvanised people to protest so quickly. You know, these aren't just Muslims or Palestinians that are protesting. These are lots of non-Palestinians, non-Muslims that are protesting around the world because of these images. And maybe that's a good thing that we're seeing that. That's why I always think that we should be showing the truth. You know, I know still they censor things. We shouldn't be censoring things because we shouldn't. If you say you want to back a war and you want you to believe that there is a justification for war without actually seeing the brutality of it, then are you really... Um, would you really say the same thing if you saw it? It's a bit like the, the you know, like the vegetarian meat uh, argument. When you see the slaughter of animals, when you see um, how they're treated and how, you know, they die and, you know, being hung up and all gutted and all that stuff, if you had to do it, you may not want to eat meat. Now, I'm not saying you need to go and fight to be able to know it, but I suppose that's actually the real thing. You you only really know whether you, you back or defend war if, 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 if you're actually doing it. But then again, you know, some people like doing things like that. But um, I think if you saw on TV the actual extent of uncensored war, the pain, the suffering, the misery, if we could watch it on a VR headset and it could be, you know, feel like it's us or our family members, then you could say, do you really think war is... is is the answer and I don't think most people would not to put it you know to try and see what everyone would think all right so we're going to end on this last bit um, which is different from the Hamas Israel war it was on um, today it was about um, climate change I'm still not sure whether I buy into it or not because you know this there's only like 200 years worth of data and that is you know being recorded by different things and different ways um you know and different amounts so there may be you know it's, plus it's such a small specimen compared to the 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 time that weather has existed on this place that we could be reading something that's just a fluctuation or a natural circle or whatever but let's say for argument's sake that it is true and that climate change is you know, because of our, you know, which makes sense, the fuels or the pollution we put up there for our necessary manufacturing of things just to make money. But what's interesting is that woman's argument. I love her passion because and this is the difference between, you know, journalists and, and, and world leaders, suited people and actual people, the passion you get, you know, that, and yeah, sometimes it can be misplaced. I'm not saying that, but what what is interesting is if it is true that you know we're all gonna you know by carrying on making new f fuel and gas elsewhere because we can't get along with the, the with the people that we found ourselves here with because we divided it all up and we're going to keep squabbling and doing all this and you know wanting to make more money than in this country and GDP and all that kind of rubbish you know the, at the expense of humanity and of this planet and of our future lives. Imagine how stupid that's going to look. And she has to sort of passionately say this. And I can hear that most people watching this are probably thinking, ah, look at her, she's, she's catastrophizing, it's not going to be that bad, and it doesn't matter because I'll be dead by then, or my children will be dead by then. But your children's children may not, or your children's children's children, your family members, actual human beings. You've got to live an existence, a beautiful existence. Imagine how they're going to live if it is true that, you know, places are all... You know, people are drowned because the water rises over the land. That people die because there's not enough vegetation, all these things. And we end up, we end up, humanity dying in a thousand years because we wanted to make money out of manufacturing unnecessary things and just making money just because we thought this is the way that our systems would be and how we should survive. How stupid that would be. Anyway, <laughs> this, this is the thing with some controversies in there that the journalists didn't want to really talk about because they can't verify it as if they only put third time on. i think you've been to see us indeed uh tell me about what the plans are today as far as the organization's concerned thanks Kay. so thank you for having me on um just to poil is making an open invitation for any members of the public anyone watching uh to join trafalgar square 12 noon every day to march peacefully, non-violently, to demand an end to new oil and gas. This march government, to where? Um, probably towards Parliament, 
I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that information, probably towards Parliament, but um, the important thing is that ordinary people are resisting the plans of this government to license more than 100 new fossil fuel um, projects in the North Sea, oil and gas, when we know the scientists are literally pulling their hair out telling us that we are in an out-and-out emergency. We can't do this anymore. You know, everyone knows this. This co People in this country, by far a majority, want an end to new oil and gas. They want real climate action. It's the government are the extremists. They are pushing this on people in a very anti-democratic way. You say that, but Labour has said that the new oil and gas um, certificates, whatever you want to call them, that have just been issued by this government, they will keep them. Another reason why we have if to keep going. Power. Another reason why we have to keep going, Kay. You know... Um, well, new oil and gas means certain death for millions and millions of people. It means displacement for billions. It means the collapse of our economy. It means the end to our public services. It means complete societal collapse. I can't really say it any clearer. It's horrors beyond our imagination. And it's irreversible, Kate. It means forever. I hear you, Zoe. I hear you. But I wonder whether... <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I mean, imagine if someone's saying that and they actually can back it up. And you're just saying, I hear you, I hear you, as if it's nothing. Wait a minute. Oh, OK, next question. And now the weather. Active. <laughs> I wonder whether it would be more effective for Just Stop Oil to get public support to have a seat inside Parliament uh, as an MP than being arrested outside Parliament. We hear these questions very, very often, Kate. Okay? And democracy doesn't begin and end at the ballot box, does it? The whole system is rigged. Everyone watching knows that. This government holds us, the citizens, in total contempt. You're seeing that day after day in the COVID inquiry, aren't you? You're seeing that in the fact that 14 million people in this country don't know where their next meal's coming from necessarily, whether they can feed their kids. They hold us in contempt, and they certainly hold young people and people in the global south in contempt. Sure when it's rigged, though, is it? So is it's completely right? rigged. I mean... <laughs> don't we have a democratic election? It's completely rigged. In what way? Well, in many, many ways. This government has accepted only last year alone, the Conservative Party, three and a half million pounds from oil interests. Um, Rishi Sunak's uh, father-in-law signed up a deal with his big business, I think, for millions of quid. See, with I don't know the with, facts of this, no, so I'm just well, going to throw in allegedly. Right yeah, 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 there, okay. so, you know. but please look it up if you're watching. Um, his father-in-law signed a deal with BP and Shell, funnily enough, Not just before oil licenses well, were licensed. As I said, it's I don't know rigged. the facts of that. You may well know the facts, and I can't challenge you on it because but, I don't know, so I'm going to ask you other stuff instead. Um, my point is that when you stop the public going about their everyday business, does that help or hinder your cause? We I mean, it's such a stupid question, really. If, if what she's saying is true, that by doing all this, by not he heeding the scientists who say that, you know, this the flooding catastrophe and, you know, the end of civilization and those types of things, if it is true, I mean, I know it seems like far-fetched, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. We have seen certain effects that are going on but they could be you know like I say just a natural progression and up and down and ebbs and flows and things but but say that it's true and for her to, to sort of say oh do you think it, you know you should just you know sit at home and, and join the conservative party or <laughs> I don't think she gets the gravity of it really does she I guess she doesn't believe it I mean but they have their own climate show We know that we sometimes cause disruption. We do everything we can to minimise that. We have a very clear blue light policy, etc. That didn't but work last week, though, did it? To be but, fair, sorry, there were, there were ambulances that were stopped last week when they were trying to, you were in the way and they couldn't get to where they needed to go. We understand from freedom of information requests that the ambulance service uh, doesn't report any significant delays caused by just stop oil actions. Every single choice at this point in humanity's history has a, has a, has a consequence, doesn't it? Whether you guys or the producers upstairs, the people in your ears, what you choose to show on this screen, whether how this show covers climate, doesn't cover climate, exactly. how you hold those in power to account or not, yes. it all has a consequence. And I guess well, um, no, no, let me let me, let me I, pick you up on that. No, no, let me. Okay. You can, but let me pick you up on that. You can't get away with that, sorry. So we invite you in. You've been invited in three times. Uh, we have a climate program, and we used to have a climate program every day here on Sky News, and we always hold politicians to account. Go on. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I know, I know Sky has been doing more than some and there are a lot worse channels. But I also know, and I, I, um, I discovered the guy called John Riley. I'd never heard of him before. I read an article, in fact, on your own website, Sky News website. Um, uh, he's the former boss of Sky News, apparently. Um, he's been well, a... Definitely not, apparently, definitely. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, I don't know him. I'm guessing you guys know him and the people upstairs probably know him, the producers and directors and stuff. Um, he was the head of Sky News until April this year. And May, actually, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've never met the guy, but he's on record in the article on your own website saying that news desks are not taking seriously enough their responsibility to alert that? the public to what is happening. Where did, you, not, where did you read that article? On your own website. There you go. Yeah, I know. There you but go. that's the kind of... <laughs> I mean... Well, does she not live in the real world? Just because some, lots of people, and especially politicians, when they leave a job, they all start talking about things that they never talked about when they were in the job. You know, when they're in the job, it's like, oh, no, that's not the case, and blah, 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 going to deflect you. And then when they leave, it's like, yeah, this one, he said this, this one, he did this, you know, like on these inquiries and things. <laughs> and also... Just because he's saying now that things should have been done doesn't mean when he was in the job he actually was proactive in making that happen because a lot of people do not do that. They they just do whatever's easiest rather than doing what's right. <laughs> the public to what is happening. Where, did you, where did you read that article? On your own website. There you go. Yeah, I know. There you but go. that's the kind of weird irony, isn't it? Like news desks are not taking seriously enough their responsibility to report to the public what's happening. You, the people listening don't understand necessarily, or maybe they do, I hope they do, that their families are at risk. All of their families are at risk. And you know what? The young people who do know this are marching with Just Stop Oil. And you know who John Riley was talking to? Our climate correspondent. Yes, Tom Heap, mm. who actually presents the climate show now. Exactly. So we are trying to do, we're going some way. So Did please, you... tell all of your listeners, tell all of we're your We're allowing audience. you to do it. Thank you're, you. You're, tell, you're allowing audience. you to do it. Everyone watching, your families are at risk. Your families are at dire, dire risk. It's not just us saying that, it's the world climate scientists. The Pope is even saying the same thing. He's saying that people need to understand that their families are threatened by new oil and gas. We have to end this. When you say this, this demonstration, these uh, series of demonstrations will go on until success, what does that actually look like? It means ending new oil and gas. No, but how long might that take? As far it, takes as, it takes as long as it takes. But another thing that your uh, uh, lovely audience needs to know, Kay, and thank you for the opportunity, it's sincerely appreciated, is that civil resistance, which is what Just Up Oil is doing, does, does make a difference. It does cut through. We know that from history, but we also know that from this year. Thousands of people in the Netherlands marched peacefully day after day and blocked uh, the A12 in The Hague for 27 days in a row. 9,000 arrests over 27 days, completely non-violent action. And that forced the police forces to go to the politicians and say, you have to negotiate with these people. They were demanding an end to okay. fossil fuel subsidies. And that's what's happened. So the politicians are going to put proposals forward to end new subsidies. Okay. So you all have so much power. Don't let people tell you that this is not the right way to do things. Okay. And also, I have to add one more point, please, that this government, this state, the judiciary, are currently locking up teenagers. There are 18 and 19-year-olds in prison right now without trial for peacefully walking on the road because they are desperate for a future. Please, everyone needs to understand that. No, they wouldn't that. be in prison without trial. You mean they are, they're, they're on remand. On remand. They're on remand. That's yeah. in a prison cell yeah. without trial for walking on a road to try desperately to get their future back from a government that is licensing the oil and gas. Okay. So join us, Trafalgar Square, noon, every day, please. OK, Zoe, thank oh, you for taking the time, as always. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, meantime, let me uh, tell you about what's happening. Oh, OK. I don't know. It's... Uh... <laughs> I mean, if she's accurate in what she's saying, we, we should be worried, shouldn't we? Because that seems like that it's um, a catastrophe waiting to happen, something we have to take seriously. But I suppose the thing is, like I would say, is this is the tip of the iceberg. This is just, like I would say, a proof of the system doesn't work that we live within, that we would do things that would endanger ourselves um, rather than do what's right or necessary. And we know that because I talk about it for the last 600 uh, producers of truth because the way we live, our system, the way we divided ourselves, the way we, that we, we've found ourselves here, everything free, all the resources free, 
and we put a price tag on it and charge each other and manufacture things just unnecessarily amounts of things just so that this person can buy from you you know like i make the example of of washing powder or cars you have the same thing that does the same thing um but there's like you know hundreds of different variations of it because this company's made one and this company's made one and this company's made one and they all want your money um in the in the and they and make it out to you that you need all this choice you need all this otherwise well, you wouldn't be happy would you <laughs> Would you rather have a, a more, uh, you know, all these people wasting their time manufacturing things unnecessarily when you could just make one thing that does what it needs to do and saves in all the fossil fuel, saves in all the unnecessary man hours, women hours, human hours that are wasted making this unnecessary thing just so that then you could get some money and you can get a house and mortgage and be to the banks and the money and all that kind of thing. So I would say that this is the tip of the iceberg of the, the systematic failure of our system and that really what we need to look at, including this, is how we treat each other, how we live on this place, how we decided that this system of having banks and having money and having you know, power uh, small uh, people, elected people, tend to go to private schools who keep passing the baton on to their friends and you only get two old people to vote for and you made to believe that this is freedom and democracy and yet people suffer and die and unnecessary things happen all the time. All the time we see how terrible this life is and we're letting it happen. There should be protest about all this stuff until it changes. Until we all decide, wait a minute, Let's get rid of money. Let's look at this again. Let's all realise that, wait a minute, we're all human beings. We don't need to cut up bits of land. We don't need to possess and be power, prideful and possessive and greedy. We can all work together. We can, you know, send people over here. This is how you do this. Let's build this. Let's make every place on this place that we live in wonderful. Let's everyone have the hospitals. Let everyone have. Let's all share our medical knowledge with each other so that we can cure cancer and HIV and AIDS and dementia and things like that quicker because we all work together. We're not trying to get a pattern. We're not trying to make money out of people. We're not going to refuse it because we don't have a, a system that is able to buy that thing. We all have all the resources and energy to do all this freely. Help each other out. Rebuild the whole place, like Sim City or something. Rebuild everything like London or New York or whatever city is the best city that has the best infrastructure and everything for everyone, one existence. Have it everywhere like that so that no one needs to suffer. No one needs to die unnecessarily. No one needs to, you know, everyone can have a house. Everyone, you know, can never have a beautiful existence. You, I know you're going to say, oh, this is a kumbaya or uh, utopia. No, it's not. It's no more... Uh, unfeasible feasible than the system that we live in where we've taught you as babies to look at each other differently even though you're exactly the same you're all human beings but you look at each other differently you treat each other differently you spend your whole life doing a job you may not even like getting money just so that you can survive and then when it's you retired you think why did i waste all my life why didn't i do all this what was my life really about as you die and your one existence is gone. And then your family carry on the same cycle. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I need to say anymore. Take care, take it easy, God bless, and peace.